The History of Western Emmerin, Part 6, The Iron Kingdom's Era. While the beginning of a new epoch was marked by the stirring of rebellion in Western Emmerin, it had been a long and terrible struggle. It was not until 202 AR that the new era was born with the Corvus Treaties. This was a gathering of the Council of Ten, necessitated by some of the difficulties of Im the immediate aftermath of the Orgoth, where each region was wrestling with established order and organizing to provide relief for thousands who were suffering. The Corvus Treaties The Council of Ten met in the city of Corvus and discussed the borders of the newly independent kingdoms. The Orgoth have let hor had left horrible scars upon the region not only from their long occupation, but the destruction left by the scourge and the battles of the rebellion. The new nations established by this treaty would become known as the Iron Kingdoms. While there was some discussion of restoring the old kingdoms that had predated the Orgoth, this was immediately rejected. The people had come to identify with the larger regions set down by the Orgoth governors. This gave rise to four kingdoms. Signar in the south, encompassing the Thornwood, the Midlands, Caspia, and a significant portion of Thuria. Cador in the north, west, including the old Cardic lands, Kosk, Skirav, and western Umbre. Lael in the northern northeast, including what would have been Rhinar and the eastern lands of old Umbre. And Ord in the west, unifying northern Thuria and Tordor. Certain groups had already seized authority amongst the Council of Ten. Caspian noble bloodlines laid claim to governing Signar, and none could refute the role of the City of Walls and its industry in the rebellion. The old Cardic nobility was well positioned to claim governance over Cador, and the Tordorians rose to rule over Ord. The once proud eastern Umbrians did not con contest the Rhine of, of rulership of Lael. Umbre had suffered particularly heavily under the, under the Orgoth, with many of its eastern noble, uh, noble bloodlines extinguished. The Rhine, the Rhine had the resources to rebuild the shattered region, and so cemented the loyalty of the surviving eastern Umbrians in this area. Not all were in agreement with over the borders, and the debates were heated. The Cadorians left dissatisfied, as they had pressed to restore lands once claimed by the old Cardic Empire, which included a substantial portion of what would be ceded to Ord, Lael, and the northern Thornwood. In the wake of the rebellion, their, their bluster had no bite. The destruction of the, the colossal factories in their control, combined with the ravages of war, had left the Cards in an extremely weak position. No one but the Cards wanted to see the old Cardic Empire restored. Reconstruction and the New World Arcane Orders The early decades after the rebellion were dominated by tremendous efforts of reconstruction across the new kingdoms. Technological gains proved many be provided many benefits, particularly in swift reemergence of steam-powered machinery. In 211 AR, the newly established Steam and Ironworks Union consolidated the laborers of hundreds of working to meet the demands of engineering productions and repair work. Within 20 years, steam-powered boats again traveled the waterways. The, mine of, the minds of arcanists and mechanics soon turned to finding other uses for technologies. The arcanists of the Fraternal Order of Wizardry were involved with expanding arcane lore. Experiencing unprecedented freedom, many of the Order's cabals followed once forbidden lines of research. Others expanded their influence, establishing major branches in the most significant of cities, particularly in Signar, Ord, and Lael. Establishing new chapter houses and acquiring lucrative contracts for mechanica fashion and fabrication work or arcane consul consultation necessitated paying bribes and doing favors for nobles and government officials, often of dubious legality. This led to a major scandal in 232 AR when a pious magnus named Copernium, named Copernium revealed that the fraternal order was riddled with corruption. Copernicium and a number of his followers left the order after accusing no a number of its highest officers of black magic and other illegal activities. The
The Order would weather this scandal, although its reputation was besmirched, and a number of mages were tired and ex tried and executed after being convicted of practicing necromancy and infernalism. Copernicum went on to establish the Morian Order of Illumination. The Order became a significant agency of the Church, specializing in matters of the arcane. While the order included pious mages seeking to follow in the footsteps of Ascendant Corbin, it became most notable for its role in the church's dedication to witch to dedicated witch hunters. The Order of Illumination vowed to stand vigilant against black magic in all forms, rooting out infernalism, necromancy, mesmerism, and Thamorite cultists responsible for spreading these nefarious acts. The Fraternal Order of Arcanists continued their innovative works. Among their accomplishments was the refinement of the Cerebral Matrix. Reducing its size and experimenting with more complex arcane relays resulted in the invention of the first Cortex, a tremendous improvement which allowed for smaller and more practical automatons. The first Steam Jack was built in 241 AR by the Fraternal Order Magus Bastian Rayleigh Routhy working with the aid of the Steam and Ironworks Union. Designed to be machines for labor instead of war, more followed, made in a variety of sizes and configurations. Improved cortexes allowed steam jacks to follow complex orders, and their smaller size required considerably less fuel and water. The demand for steam jacks created an entire industry, while also bringing the tide of wealth to, into the fraternal order of wizardry. Cador meanwhile continued to seethe over her lost territories and the need to relay to rely on private agencies like the fraternal order for its cortexes and the order of the golden crucible for blasting powder having restored much of its industry and expanding both its mining and manufacturing capabilities the northern nation had been begun to restore its armed might the cadorian sovereign king lavish Zepeshis was aware that this na his nation stood in peril and could never properly defend itself so long as Colossals remained solely in the hands of Signarans. Secretly, he ordered new foundries to be built in Korsk. Lavish's spy master conducted, uh, contacted arcanists of Kedorian bloodline who had gone abroad to learn the secrets of varying arcane orders. A conspiracy began amongst the northern arcanists, including several that had gained the trust and confidence of officers of the Fraternal Order's stronghold in Sorel, as well as the Thunderhead Fortress in the, of the Golden Crucible in Laren. In 243 AR, these conspirators stole hundreds of irreplaceable tomes of arcane lore, alchemic formulae, and complex and cortex fabrica fabrication schematics. Upon their return, these patriotic arcanists were rewarded by a lavesh, many with, tied, with titles, and they formed the Greylord Covenant, an exclusively Cadorian order that quickly became the extension of the Cadorian military and connected to that, net, that nation's spy network. Cador now had, can now manufacture her, their her own cortexes and had blasting powder as access to raw materials was allowed. The Trollkin and Colossal Wars Signar didn't immediately respond to Cador's rearmament, being brought up in a ma being caught up in a massive Trollkin uprising, which spread to the Gnarls and the Thornwoods starting in two forty two AR. While the Trollkin Krells of the region were were uh, had been given allowances in the Corvinus treat in the Corvus treaties, the Krells had found their lands violated by humans seeking resources for fewer reconstruction efforts. Combined with human efforts to exploit every waterway for shipment of goods and materials, the Krells found themselves being overrun and pushed out of several regions in disregard of old agreements. Unrest escalated into full war which swept across northern Signar and southern Ord. Eventually Signar committed its colossals to battle against the Trollkin and where these giant machines strode, the Trokin fell in droves. In 247 AR, after suffering several brutal setbacks, the Trokin surrendered, and thus ended the First Trokin War. By the time the Signaran spies had learned of, a great of the great foundries of war, ma of many of war materials in Korsk, accordingly, the Signaran Colossals remained in the region rather than returning to Caspia. 
the, these Colossals and Warcasters became the Colossal Guard, headquartered out of Deepwood Tower in the Thornwood, where they could keep watch with the, of the border they shared with Kador. Just three years later, King Lavesh committed, committed to, a massive, to massive attacks against both Western Lyell and Northern Ord, striking to seize lands that had once been a part of the old Cardic Empire. The ensuing war engulfed all the nations of the Iron Kingdoms, as Lyell, Signar, and Ord fought together against the Cardorians. For the first time, Colossals clashed face to face by those built by the Cardorian hands, contested by those from Signar. Older Signaran Colossals did not fare well in the earlier battles, suffering against more recent designs and heavily armored Cadorian machines. Signaran foundries blazed day and night to produce newer and better Colossals. The Colossal War was a seven-year conflict that saw the old piece of the Corvus Treaties permanently shattered. Massive iron giants tore each other apart amidst fields of rifle fire, bloodied pikes, and explosive displays of arcane magic. Ultimately, Kador's war industry proved incapable of sustaining the pace of production. Not only were Kador's attacks repulsed, but the allied armies of the three southern nations made advances on Kadorian soil. Kador finally surrendered in 257 AR after losing decisively at Volingrad. The Kadorians suffered the indignity of agreeing to dismantle their remaining colossals as well as the foundries that they had been built. Signar ceded back land siege from Kador in the conflict, having no expectations of permanently occupying them. While Kador was pacified, the Trokan Krells of the region had regained their strength and had grown more militant, organized, and indignant about the human armies marching through their lands. Trokan incursions into Ordic and Signaran territories escalated into the Second Trokan War uh, by 662 AR. The Trokans had learned from previous battles and conducted strikes strategically, taking advantage of the terrain to covered retreats and making it difficult for the Colossal Guard to retaliate. The gigantic machines had begun to show their limits, having been designed for attacking fixed positions, other Colossals, and masses of enemy forces. They had difficulty negotiating the dense forests while fighting enemies using skirmish tactics. Several times Trokan and full-blood trolls fighting alongside them managed to incapacitate Colossals using primitive means which shamed the Signaran military leaders. In response, Signar's king, Woldred, ordered his generals to innovate new weapons. Arcane mechanics along with consulates, consultants from the Fraternal Order of Wizardry presented the concept of warjacks, made, uh, making use of smaller but still formidable chassis employed by labor steamjacks but modifying them for war. The first war jacks served in the final years of the Second Trokan War, proving their effectiveness as the Trokans were driven back. King Waldred personally attended peace talks with representatives of the Krells to end hostilities at Hedrelio Fields in, six, in 267 AR. The Signaran crown deemed the Trokans had legitimate grievances and granted the Krells expanded lands and paid sums for the restoration of the destroyed villages in addition to granting the Trokan regular fees for the use of certain waterways. The Trokan were to be subject to Signaran law except within the narrow confines of their Krell lands where they could govern themselves. Military strategists and the younger generations of warcasters were quick to see the advantages of the new jacks. These constructs had been built with the, with the latest and most sophisticated cortexes, had a much greater range of motion, and could be fielded more easily alongside infantry. The combination of advances to the Cortexes, along with their ability to be independently negotiated terrain, meant that a Warcaster could more easily control multiple Warjacks. By 286 AR, King Waldred decommissioned the Colossals and had his engineers convert those great foundries into Warjack production. Production of similar machines was embraced by other nations as well. While war fabrication proceeded apace, the peace was strengthened by a changing of royal dynasties in Kador. The long and dark reign of Lavesh Sepeshis the Tormentor ended with his death at old age in 272 AR. King Dmitri Dobacheski ousted the warlike Sepeshis line and proved to be a more peaceful and diplomatic sovereign, willing to engage in negotiations with foreign ambassadors. 
Indeed, an amicable relationship was established between King Waldred and Dimitri, as the two shared similar ruling philosophies. The Grim Years of King Malagant The political situation in Signar changed after King Waldred drafted his Accord by Hand Covenant in 286 AR. Waldred's accord allowed for the Signarn king to choose his own successor, even outside of his bloodline, so long as the successor was of significant noble blood. To satisfy probity, Waldred required the terms of succession be witnessed and implemented by the Mennite priesthood, who had long overseen royal succession as keepers of the true law. While, Mennite, while the Mennite religion had waned to the minority status in Signar, they retained significant sway with the nobles and retained authority by ancient right. While this accord would provide the merit would provide its prove its merits, stabilizing the Signaran succession in subsequent centuries, Waldrit was unable to benefit. He died suddenly in two eighty nine AR and his own terms disappeared. The Mennite priesthood came forward to act on his wishes, but faced a sudden coup by Waldred's nephew, Malagant, who led an arm, a small army to claim the crown. Called the Grim King, Malagant proved to be a bloodthirsty tyrant who consolidated his power by executing rivals and gaining a stranglehold on the royal assembly. After an outbreak of public outcry, Malagant entered into an alliance with the Church of Morrow, which had been seeking to establish his supremacy as the kingdom's major religion. The Church of Morrow's is endorsement of Malagant's right to be the, to the throne served as to, to pacify many of the kingdom's pious citizens and nobles. But when the Caspian Temple of Menov refused to do the same, Malagant accused the priests of treason and had them arrested, tried, and executed. By the end of 290 AR, over 200 Mennite priests and officials had been sent to the gallows. This provoked years of religious unrest that created a lasting rift between these religious religions in Signar. Two separate assassination attempts on King Malagant gave the king the justification he required to make the royal decree in 293 AR that the Church of Morrow was now the state religion of Signar. The ancient rites once granted to the Mennite priests were revoked. In a dark time that for Mennites in Caspia, many old temples in the western city had been desecrated and several were set ablaze. Acts, acting allegedly to protect ordinary Mennites, Malagan ordered hundreds of families forcibly relocated to eastern Caspia, and many of their assets were seized. A large portion of the city of the east of the Black River became home to the city's largest Mennite minority. While it was reduced, while this reduced violence, it cemented the division between Caspia's major faiths. Addendum: Discovery of Cyrus, the Clockwork Goddess. In, in 283 AR, an astronomer of the Fraternal Order of Wizards named Adolphus Agamor discovered a celestial body, a quote dark wanderer unquote, by use of powerful telescopes. Soon thereafter, Agamor was beset by strange dreams where he claimed were visionary. Through these he learned the name of this planet, Cyrus, and become convinced that he was in communion with a divine being. Agamor wrote of the planet in, as the body of the clockwork goddess, or the maiden of gears. Agamor was discredited by his peers until other reputable astronomers began to have similar dreams and started to respond, started to correspond with, and then meeting him in person. This gave rise to the cult of Cyrus, Western Immigrants' newest religion. Cyrus's place in the cosmology is not well understood by theologians. Her worshippers believe Cyrus to be a hidden primal goddess, not a new deity, only a newly discovered one. She embodies fundamental natural principles, in particular those that govern the movement of celestial bodies and the means by which the world can be understood through mathematics. Her domain is astronomy, mathematics, and engineering, and her adherents, adherents claim that she is awaiting discovery by those intelligent enough to unravel her location and to decipher clues revealing deeper mysteries. Enigmas and puzzles are central to the cult's relationship with the goddess, as they believe she provides portents through hidden codes and solutions buried in obscure mathematical formulas. Rumors about clockwork 
priests that had surrounded that had surrendered their bodies to gain immortality as machines seemed to particularly precariously close to necromancy by Morian standards, but these rumors have yet to be confirmed. The Border Wars King Dimitri of Cador was assassinated in 286 AR, and the throne was claimed by his wife, Cereza. She proved to be a blood, bloody-minded monarch who quickly set about preparing for war. Queen Cereza hoped to take advantage of the Signaran succession problems by seizing the northern Thornwood. She hoped to gain access to the Black River, which would enable Cador to disrupt trade along the, their vital waterways. Cereza entered into an unusual agreement with the savage Thran tribes of the Thornwood, some of, of the last descendants of the Mulgur, encouraging them to attack Signar while Cador's armies made their advances. The Thran proved to be formidable adversaries in this familiar terrain. Signar put aside their religious differences in light of this new threat, and the Crown mustered their own armies while also hiring large mercenary forces to bolster their numbers. This was the start of an extended conflict that would eventually be called the Border Wars. The earlier years of this conflict have been largely had been assumed legendary proportions. Cereza had been described as a sorcerer queen of Cador, vilified in the southern kingdoms as a Thamorite. Cadorians have refuted this, but Cereza is certainly feared by her own people and was suspected of having killed her husband. The involvement of the Thran tainted these battles as the, these savages conducted barbarous rites, including feasting on the flesh of the fallen. While King Malagan was a tyrant, the barbarity of his enemies combined with the support of the Church of Morrow brought many Morwen knights and priests into conflict on his side. The war in the Thornwood was, pro was proclaimed a struggle between light and darkness, a claim supported by Thran manifesting a fell bloody sorcery. While Morian's battle chap while Morian battle chaplains invoked miracles through fervent prayers, adding to the mystery surrounding this war was the peculiar end of both sovereigns. Cereza vanished in 295 A.R. and her body was never found. King Malagan suffered a number of personal tragedies in the course of the war, including the betrayal of one of his most trusted champions, leading to the death of his beloved queen. Two months after Cereza disappeared. He died of a wasting disease. The fighting in the Thornwood proved inconclusive, and the border wars would outlast both tyrants. The Signaran succession had been cast into turmoil by the rise of Malagan and the dismissal of the Menite priests, leaving the kingdom for twelve years without a king. During this time, the royal assembly and various military leaders attempted to govern the nation, but with limited success. Cador proved quicker to take advantage of the situation. Their own succession placed a child queen on the throne, but she was supported by the ambitious Lord Regent Velabor, who ruled in her stead. Seeing the weakness of the Signaran position, Velabor launched the first expansion war, the most successful years in the border wars for Cador. Rather than confronting Signar, Velabor urged his armies to strike against Northern Ord. While some of the initial assaults were repulsed by the stalwart Oryk defenders, the Cadorian army gained momentum and began making solid gains. The Oryk crown appealed to Signar for aid, but were only given token military support as the Signarans were torn by political division. Velabor expanded his operations and sent a smaller army into the eastern Lyell. The war ground to over several years as both Lyellese and Oryk armies failed to halt the Cadorian advance. The Ordic king Alavar Cathor I was killed in, ba in the Battle of the Broken Sword in 301 AR, heroically leading a charge against the enemy. His broken sword was recovered and became an important Oryk symbol representing defiance. The Cadorans pressed on and in the next year gained the greatest victory with the seizure of the northern port city of Ragnavo. Siege of Midfest One of Velabor, Velabor's shrewdest maneuvers amidst this extended conflict was finding a way to turn an, intention, an internal conflict to his benefit. Even as the Trollkins inside Signar undermined Waldred's peace, Cador struggled with his tribal peoples, remnants of its forgotten age. 
A large number of barbarian tribes persisted in the frozen north of the mountains and forests. The last great alliances of these tribes assembled in late in 304 AR, intent on pillaging the fertile farmlands of the interior, which had been undefended. Velabor met with tribal leaders and convinced them to strike at the south, where the gains and glory would be greater. The barbarians turned their numbers against Ord, laying siege to the heavily fortified city of Midfast. Velabor intended to use them as shock fodder to, pre to presiege his invasion deeper into Ord. The Ord defenders had been pushed back to a long line of rugged hills stretching west and east from Midfast, which had proven difficult to assault. Seeing Midfus as the linchpin of the Ord defenses, Velabor hoped to crush the city beneath the Horde and sweep into the capital. Midfus held for weeks against the Horde while his defenders dwindled. The siege of Midfus would become one of the most famous battles in the history of Western Emmerin, remembered for the heroism of Captain Marcus Garza, an Ordic captain and devout Morwen who led the defenders after the deaths of his superior officers. Even before his legendary last stand, Marcus proved his skill and dedication, holding against vastly superior numbers. Despite his efforts, an expected reinforcement army from the capital did not arrive, bogged down and amid muddy roads. As Midfest's ammunition stores dwindled and its wounded defenders fell, faced exhaustion, Marcus went alone from the city under a banner of truce. Drawn on his knowledge of the benefits of the northern tribe, Marcus offered a ritual challenge to the chiefs of the Horde. By their terms, Marcus was required to fight all fourteen chieftains, each in turn, a seemingly impossible task. As the gathered barbarians and defenders of the wall watched, the siege was put on hold for a week as Marcus faced two duels a day with the mightiest barbarian chieftains. Amid this crucible, Marcus found one victory after victory, suffering grave injuries on the fifth and sixth day. His resolve daunted the remaining chieftains. By the final day, even the barbarians of the Horde cheered for Marcus above their own. In the last day of the battle, Marcus found the inner resolve, reserves to endure, calling on his faith. A synod Katarina manifested in the sky above Marcus, as Marcus defeated the last chieftain and promptly collapsed. The light of Marcus's ascension to join Katarina awed the gathered uh, even as the forces of Oric army finally arrived to advance on the Horde. Thousands of barbarians were so stunned that they surrendered at once, casting weapons aside. Those that fought were swept aside from the battlefield and written down. The Kadoran army had been camped to the north of the barbarians and witnessed the miracle of ascension. Seeing Maro stood against them, their, rank, their ranking commandant ordered them to quit the field. Against all odds, Ord stood victorious. The northern barbarian tribes never regained their strength, while Marcus became a revered figure amongst Morwen soldiers. Despite this defeat, the Kadoran army persisted in the months ahead and the border wars continued for eight long and bloody years. The siege of Midfest is seen as a major turning point as Kador had no significant gains after this and Velabor became increasingly hated and despised. Juliana, the maiden queen, took the Signaran throne in 308 AR and sent armies to support both Ord and Lael. Signar soon entered the formal, into a formal alliance with Lyell, and Signaran soldiers and warjacks became a common sight in the last battles of this period. Queen Anya Vanar V assumed her, her majority in 307 AR, but it is not until 313 AR that she realized Velabor and his military advisors had bankrupted the kingdom's treasury. Ousting the former Lord Regent and her cronies, she put an end to the war and negotiated peace. Ladrai was ceded back to Lael, but the Kadorians retained Radavo, which they named Vladador. Addendum The Destruction of Isra and the Defeat of Everblight. In 390 AR, the Iosian city of Isra was beset by horror and carnage by the emergence of the dragon Ethobal, also known as Everblight. This dragon had secreted itself beneath the city and had been laying there for centuries, capturing Lyosians and exposing them to his dragonic blight. 
the existence of this dragon was discovered when one of the blighted victims got loosed from the empty fane of, of Isla and killed several innocents. The dragon's existence was deduced by Ocean diviners, prompting considerable alarm. While military forces qu quickly gathered, from the gates and of mists and storms, the Iosians underestimated the threat. Rather than evacuate the city, the soldiers sought to confront the dragon directly. Erobal erupted from the earth and began wholesale carnage, laying waste to Isera and slaughtering thousands of its inhabitants. Eventually, milita massed military forces overwhelmed it, but it was only after suffering staggering losses. Is I Iosin sages knew enough to extract the dragon's Othnic, which was sealed away and sent to the lands of the frozen northwest, hoping it would never be disturbed. End addendum. Velibor was exiled and lived the rest of his days as a pariah, remembered for having wasted a generation of Kedorians in his wars. While the cost was deemed too high, Velibor succeeded in expanding the borders of the motherland and would be remembered less harshly in succeeding generations. The Quiet Century The time known as the Quiet Century was an era closer to 150 years where the kingdoms thrived and prospered without being marred in open war. This would be a time of tremendous invention and growth and also saw the start of the rising middle class across several kingdoms as the gains from the industrialization began to manifest. Through, though conflict was inescapable, the character of warfare in this period shifted from open declarations of hostilities between the Iron Kingdoms to smaller scale sporadic battles as the kingdoms tested borders and added new innovations to their armed forces. Espionage and sabotage became the more common expansion of the expression of hostilities in this period. The Quiet Century saw a resurgence of mercenary tradition that had thrived in the Thousand Cities era. With, kingdoms, with kingdom armies reluctant to engage, but governments still competing, it became common for mercenary companies to be hired to conduct proxy wars, earning considerable coin for their playmakers. This century saw the founding of several significant universities and military academies, while systemic efforts were put forth to expand scholastic pursuits mastery of mechanica and the train of military officers equipped with the ch for the changing face of warfare. A number of mechanical wonders were created in this gap between major wars and, the, and conflicts. In 343 AR, Magnus Julian Montfort created the first prototype for warcaster armor. The founding of the Cadorian Mechanics Assembly in 393 AR did much to promote and encourage engineering in the nation. It, this would eventually lead to the military advances such as man -o war armor and the implementation of the first major railroads. While costly to build and slow to develop, rail lines began to implement numerous began to in, be implemented in numerous regions, first to expedite mining but later employed for wide varieties of shipping. In 436 AR, Signarn Magus Ashlyn Halstead invented the Arctec rel Relay a precursor to the modern arc node, a mechanism that greatly enhanced the tactical operations options for warcasters on the battlefield. Religious scholarship achieved advances as the sanctum, theolog as sanctum theo theologians sought to reconcile the beliefs of major faiths, leading to a cohesive cosmology. Several tomes of scholarly study were printed describing the memories of those who had died briefly, briefly but then returned to life by miraculous intervention. This led to the publishing of The Accounts of Your Can by Exenant Reinand Gorshia in 320 AR, an account in the geography of the afterlife that, provided, that proved to be extremely popular. The Caspian Temple of Menoth responded 15 years later with City of Souls, a vivid description of the city of man, Menoth's domain, with exhortations for humanity to heed the word of the lawgiver. As a remainder of Thamorites of the Mars' pervasive influence across or on Imran, the city of Mercer, of Mercer was nearly burnt to the ground in 415 AR by Sashia Varsh, who had been branded a witch by, demand, by the demand of the city's order of fraternal wizardry. 
Evading capture, she subsequently declared war on the city's arcane society and nearly consumed the city in a conflagration before her dark ascension. Sashia struggles embodied a number of independent arcanists, emboldened a number of independent arcanists who were struck out of the order, believing it was unfair to hoard arcane lore. Caspian spies took advantage of this by paying bribes to encourage theft of specific materials and and thereby acquiring schematics for their own use. Signaran Armory subsequently began to construct its own advanced military-grade cortexes. The Second Expansion War Cannon fire off the coast of Ord sounded the end of the quiet century when Cadorian and Ordic nav navies clashed in 464 AR. What began as a dispute over piracy soon erupted into the Second Expansion War, as King Mikhail Vanar ordered the invasion of Ord. The naval battles of this war were among the largest and most impressive ever conducted in Western Emirate, involving hundreds of warships in mass battles. Turning to her naval power, Kador bypassed Midfist with its great army, landing forces to storm Corbin instead. While Signar was not allied to Or, King Hector's son Bright II foresaw future peril to its neighbor if it was compromised. He sent his, his northern army to, to Sorel to, har to harass the Cadorian ships, while his land forces secured the Rungnar River, preventing Kador from taking Breck, creating a stalemate by winter. This worked against the Cadorians, as they were overextended and their supply lines from Corbin remained vulnerable. After two years of bitter fighting, the mixed Cadorian and Oryx soldiers pushed the Northmen back. A number of mercenary companies as far away as Lael and Caspia joined in the conflict. When the Cadorians were pushed back to Corbin in late 467 AR, Signar withdrew. The Oryx treasury was solely pressed by the hungry mercenaries and could no longer pay their wages. The loss of the Signarans and mercenaries extended the war another year before the beleaguered Oryx army liberated Corbin and a truce was declared in 468 AR. The Cadorans had lost their taste for battle as King Mikhail fell to illness and died weeks before the end of the war. Addendum The Coin War a minor but notable conflict broke out during, the ti during this time in Lael. Seeing Signar sweep into, swept into civil war, Cador invested its mercenaries into assaulting the small, this smaller nation. Lael hired its own mercenaries to defend its territories. The Coin War was an escalation, escalating series of battles conducted almost entirely by proxy. This was an extremely lucrative time for mercenary companies in the region as they entered into biting, bidding wars for, with both sides. This war ended inconclusively, but with both Lais and Cadorian treasuries diminished, this was the result of forcing Lael to re reduce its standing army, and after the end of the civil war, Signar felt obliged to send additional troops to the region to protect its ally. This period would mark the start of Lael's growing dependence on Signaran military. End addendum. Signaran Civil War While internal strife had been overlooked amidst other conflicts, Signar simmered with the rising tide of religious animosity between the Menites and Morwins. This had occasionally erupted into isolated instances of bloodshed, but previous clashes were nothing compared to the rift that would tear Caspia in half starting in 482 AR. Among the Menites of the eastern city arose a charismatic and vocal ranking priest named Sulan. He put forth a summons calling for all Signaran Menites to come to Caspia and attend his words. This summons spread quickly and tens of thousands of Menites gathered from all corners of the kingdom. Before these masses, Sulan proclaimed himself Hierarch a special title associated with the absolute power of the priest kings of old. He simultaneously seized control of Caspia, east of the river, driving out any not of the faith. Thinking a riot was at hand, but unaware of the nature of the Menite throngs, the Caspian city watched as tried to, the city watch tried to disperse the crowds. This prompted a frenzied revolt as thousands of pilgrims rose up and slew over 300 watchmen. This incident ignited the Signaran Civil War, 
which ranged, which ranged from 482 to 484 AR. Zealous Menites nearly raised the, the river districts to, of the west bank of the city in the fighting that followed. The fate of Signar's capital seemed to hang in the balance until Sulon himself fell in battle. His death dealt a great blow to the morale of the Menites and opened the door for peace. High Prelate Sevan, head of the Morwian Church's treasury and a woman of spotless reputation, stepped forward. Serving as a spokeswoman for Signar's King Bolton Gray V, she entreated Sulan's successor, Vicegoth Orel, with all for, for an end of all the violence. After protracted discussions with concessions from both sides, the Protectorate of Menite was created to end the religious strife. For a time this succeeded. The Menites were seated an expanse of land east of the Black River and in, tre and in, and in the entirety of, the Western Ca of eastern Caspia which they renamed Sul in honor of Hierarch Sulon. The protectorate had, had, to leave, had to leave to govern their people as they saw fit without, without interference from the Signaran throne. It was understood that the protectorate would remain part of Signar and subject to disarmament and taxation. Shivan ascended to join Morrow in 500 AR and is prayed to by, by negotiation for peace or signing contracts made in good faith. The peace she achieved would not last indefinitely, but Shivan's name is still invoked by those trying to soothe religious disputes. The Expansion of the Protectorate The Sulmanites quickly expanded into the harsh territories east of the Black River. These largely barren lands were seen as a challenge from Menite, from, from Minoth, and would the, their subjugation a divine mandate. The protectorate would over time convert most of the Indrian, of the Indaran tribes. A great earthquake in 504 AR amid one of the largest of these conflicts devastated the Indrians and left the Sul Menite soldiers intact. This was seen as a divine sign and prompted the conversion of tens of thousands of Adrians to the Menite faith, bringing them, bringing with them the large settlements of, in the, of Emir. This city would become increasingly important as it was built up through great con construction efforts before being transformed into the capital of the protectorate. The Sewell Menites soon discovered a number of previously unknown resources. This included abundant diamonds that could be bartered for foreign, with foreign powers and massive underground deposits of flammable oil that would be processed into the Menites, into Menoff's Fury, a powerful incendiary liquid. Additionally, the hills east of Emir proved to be rich in iron and other minerals, and in time the Sewell Menites discovered long abandoned quarries, allowing the construction of great temples and towering buildings in Emir. One of the greatest finds of the era was the rediscovery of ancient Ichthyr and what remained of the walls bearing the original true law. Through these and other signs, the Sul Menites grew resolved to the notion that their settling in this region was preordained and would facilitate the restoration of Menoth's Menoth's faith across western Emirin. The First Thorn War Crowned in 489 AR, five years after the end of the Civil War, Signar's King Grigory Malfest led his nation in an era of growth not seen since the days of Waldred the Diligent. Steamjacks became prevalent, and the once depleted Signaran coffers filled with coin. Instrumental in this was Malfest's trusted vassal, Archduke Ventor Ralthorn II. The Archduke would play a major role in the conflicts of the region. The, K the Kedorian king, Rusalan Vagnar, Vagor, or Vigor, was a man of dark tempers and simmering rage. While no one dared speak about it openly, Kedorian nobles deemed their king mad. Vigor saw himself as K Kedovic reborn. When fired with Menite zeal, his mental instability was made him a difficult man for the Kadoran Menite priests to embrace. Vigor nursed a hatred for Signar and his prosperity, and accordingly, he initiated a wild plan of conquest. Despite his dubious sanity, King Vigor implemented numerous lasting reforms in the Kadorian military. 
As Vigor's, at Vigor's request, the nation invested in more war jacks than have ever been produced, and he also increased the scope of martial organizations like the Iron Fangs, trained to fight enemy war jacks. After working to create the greatest army seen in the modern age, in late 510 AR, Vigor sent a portion of this force, including the bulk of the renowned Kadorian cavalry, to harass the border defenders of Lael knowing this would force King Malfest to respond. As predicted, Signar's king sent its main force, led by Venter Rauthorn, north to beat back the impending invasion. At the same time, Vigor personally led an even larger force of Warjacks and the full might of the Kadorian army in heavy infantry straight into the Thornwood, hoping to drive south and take key Signaran territories, unopposed. No one suspected Vigor's ruse. The Kadorians chopped right straight through the Thornwood, raising a path 200 miles long that would later become known as the Warjack Road. If not for the work of the scouts of the of Philang, who discovered this column, Signar might have felt the full brunt of this unexpected Kadorian army deep within its borders. Soldiers hastily drawn from the nearest towns and cities met the Kadorians at the Dragon's Tongue, at, even as the main army rushed to defend Lyell, who was recalled in a desperate attempt to intercept the Kadorian advance. The Battle of the Tongue in early 511 AR remains one of the bloodiest clashes in the history of the region, seeing a loss of more warjacks in a single battle than ever before. The battle ended with Vigor's demise on the blade of Ventor Rauthorn II. This short but costly war left an imprint on both kingdoms, deepening the old hatreds and seeing the improvements of their respective militaries.